Amen. Amen. I'm so glad that you're here today. And, um, you know, we serve an awesome God. And, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is beyond anything we can possibly ask for or want. And um, I'm just so thankful for, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be preaching out of uh, Isaiah chapter 55. And if you have your scripture and want to go ahead and open up to Isaiah 55, and um, we'll camp out there this morning. You know, America, according to the late Billy Graham, is said to have the highest per capita boredom more than any other spot on the earth. He says this, he says, we know this because we have the greatest number of artificial amusements of any country. People have become so empty that they can't even entertain themselves. They have to pay other people to amuse them, to make them laugh, to try to make them feel warm and happy and comfortable for a few minutes, to try to lose that awful, frightening, hollow feeling, that terrible, dreaded feeling of being lost and alone. You know, Gordon Dowell, he says this, he says, most middle-class Americans tend to worship their work, to work at their play, and to play at their worship. And as a result, their meanings and values are distorted, their relationships disintegrate faster than they can keep them in repair and their lifestyles resemble a cast of characters looking for a plot. You know, as we are in this Christmas season, we can make and we can spend all of the money in the world and we can give and receive the most expensive presents on earth. But you need to understand that those things will never satisfy your soul. They will never satisfy your soul. You know, in other words, at Christmas of all times, why do we tend to highlight the material things at the expense of the much more important spiritual things? See, the words that I've just said, talking about the emptiness, We're trying to fill our lives that are empty with things that don't satisfy. And this is very important because I've been thinking about this word, you know, exclusive. And and I don't know if you've ever been to a very exclusive um, hotel or or restaurant or store. But I got to say, I don't feel very comfortable there. You know, I, I've been to some very nice restaurants and I've, I've, I've also sensed that, you know, sometimes people looking down their nose at me, you know, and, and, and I certainly didn't feel welcome. And you think about that word exclusive and it means that a certain number of people, certain kind of people are going to be excluded. Probably those who don't have much money, maybe those who aren't millionaires or, or those kind of things. But understand this, that the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not exclusive. Jesus is not exclusive. The blessings of Almighty God are not exclusive. No one is excluded from the free offer of eternal life. And it doesn't matter how much money you have or if you have no money at all. It doesn't matter. See, God offers joy and he offers peace at no cost to anyone who will seek him in repentance. Before it's too late. Before it's too late. You know, the book of Isaiah is often called the the fifth gospel because it has so many references to the coming messiah and his good news of salvation and one of the best sections of isaiah is chapter 55 which is very relevant for the christmas season 
You know, at a time when we're spending records amount of money on, on Christmas presents for friends and for family, it's good to hear what Isaiah 55 says to us. And I want to highlight for you this morning four key words, four key words that God speaks through Isaiah to Israel, his people, but he also speaks that to us. Let's read this, this chapter. There's 13 verses, um, and uh, we, can, we can stand some of the reading of God's word. Amen? Amen. We need that. Let's read in, in chapter 55, verse 1, it begins, God's word says this. It says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you have, you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good. And delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear to me and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. According to the faithful mercies shown to David, behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Verse six, seek the Lord while he found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout, furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Verse 12, for you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. Instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up and it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. Loving Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the joy of our salvation. I thank you, Father, for all of the things that you are doing in and through your body. Father, we pray that you would send a great revival. Father, I pray for a a spirit of repentance among your people. I pray, Father, that you would do what only you can do. And, Father, that is to draw men and women to yourself. Father, I pray that you would indeed save those around, all around us, Father. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to see the truth of your word. And, Father, may it pierce us through. I pray, Father, for a great awakening in this place, in our hearts, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. You know, this morning, I just wanted to point out these four key words out of this passage, and the very first one is the word come. Come, and and, you know, it, it, it summarizes verses one through five, and, and, and notice the word occurs three times in the very first verse. The the, the prophet writes, come, come. 
And he, he talks of drinks there to picture um, the receiving of this new spiritual life. I mean, we saw, we saw some folks, their testimony of, of what has happened in their heart. And Isaiah is painting us a word picture here of, of, of three drinks that, that, that picture the receiving of this spiritual life. The first one is water. Come, he says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And I love that. Come to the waters. So you have water, and that is for refreshment. He also says, come, uh, buy wine and milk. Wine is for enjoyment. The milk is for nourishment. And, and, and all three of these are benefits of our relationship with the Lord. You think about that. Because of your relationship with the Lord, you have refreshment. Because of your relationship with the Lord, you have enjoyment. Because of your relationship with the Lord, you have nourishment. See, he, he brings all three of those. And, and that's why he's saying, come. And understand that, that none of this can come from a purchase that we can make. It's free. It comes from the Lord. You know, this word come, it was Jesus' word. It occurs 385 times in the Gospels. 385 times Jesus said, come, come, come follow me. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Let the little children come to me. He says, come and see. And so he, he uses this over and over. And here in Isaiah 55, the Lord is addressing this passage in particular to those who are thirsty. Those who are thirsty. Come, everyone who thirsts. You see, thirst is a metaphor for spiritual need. Do you have a thirst? Do you have a, a spiritual need? I love this. Jesus began his ministry by saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He told the people of his own day that he is the water of life. Whoever comes to him and drinks from him would. See, the Bible is saying that if you have a spiritual longing, if you have a spiritual thirst, if, if you want something deeper in your life, if you are thirsty on the inside, all you need to do is come. To Christ he will take care of that thirst on the inside see the very last invitation that we have in God's word in the Bible is in Revelation chapter 22 verse 1 and verse 17 it says this then he showed me a river of the water of life clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. You buy it, you can't earn it. It comes from the Lord. See, the message of Christmas is the message of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the one, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. I love that. Because when you come to Christ, it, it simply means that you come as you are by simple faith. You say, Lord Jesus, I'm thirsty I'm thirsty for you and I believe that you died 
in my place and that, and that you rose again for me and as best as I know how, I repent of my sins and I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. But folks, that's what each one of us must do in order to receive Christ. We must come to Him. If you are thirsty on the inside, come to Him. And notice how Jesus is described in this passage. You read verse 3 and 4. It says, incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I everlasting covenant with you. Oh, I'm so thankful that he included me. I'm so thankful that he included me that I'm not excluded from that. That he says, come, incline your ear. I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the mercies of David. I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for peoples. Oh, oh, how great that is. You know, this, this verse has implications for the, the coming great millennial reign of, of our Lord Jesus that Isaiah talks so much about and that's described also in the book of Revelation. But there are implications for us too. See, we have a message about Jesus, the son of David. And that message is for all the nations because he is Lord over all the earth. This first word that I want to impress upon your mind, that I want to emboss it on your mind, is come. We must come to him. And the second part of this chapter can be summed up in the word seek. Look at verse 6, if you would. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I love this. You know, the background of this appeal is very evident, though. Because, listen, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. But think about this. There may come a time when a person cannot find God. It says, seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. There may come a time in your life and mine when it's too late. You know, we have maybe now and forever made a hard pass on the open gate of grace. See, I think this is huge because one of the biggest frustrations that I have seen in ministry has been how some people procrastinate getting saved. Okay, and what I mean by that is I've talked to lots and lots of people. I've visited with them on the street. I've visited with them in their homes trying to talk to people about their souls. And they're good folks. They're good people, just like you and I. And, and, and I've asked them, and if you ask them, they would say that they believe in God. They're not atheists. They're not agnostics. Some of them believe that Jesus died and rose again. But they aren't ready or willing to follow him and allow him to be their Lord. They'll say things like, well, I know I need to get right with the Lord. And someday I'm going to do that. Someday I'm going to do that. But understand, maybe a few of them did. Over the, the past 25 years, I would say that a good number of these people have died. And if I had to guess, I'd say that some of them may very well be in hell. Understand, I'm not the judge. I'm not the one judging them. But I've never understood people procrastinate especially when they have heard and understood and even know the truth seek the Lord while he may be found call upon him while he is near listen the time when he may be found is the time of preaching it's the time when we're hearing God's word proclaimed 
That is the time that he may be found because you're not going to hear him proclaimed out there. So the time of hearing is now. The time of responding to him, of seeking him. And people can reject the message and they can refuse to see the light until they can't. Until it's too late. Seek the Lord while he may be found. But also notice verse seven, our third key word here is the word return. Turn to the Lord. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man, his thoughts, um, and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. See this word return means to repent. It means to turn away from from where you are going, what you are doing, and turn back toward the Lord. To to return to him and and, and to repent. And, And the door of faith in Christ for salvation must be opened by a repentant heart. It takes our repentance of coming to him and saying, Lord, you know and I know that I am a sinner and and owning that sin that we've done that we've committed against him, against our Lord. And, and, and it says there, if we will seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him, let's take his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. And what is the result of that? He will have compassion on him. And it says, for he will abundantly pardon. Folks, these, these verses also reflect the need for Christ's forerunner to come, John the Baptist. You know, as, as, as the man who came in the spirit and the power of, of Elijah, John the Baptist came preaching repentance to God's people. He came re- <laughs> preaching repentance to God's people. Somehow we think that we're clear, that we're free and clear. That it's those people out there that need Jesus, that need revival, that need repentance. But repentance starts with the house of God. It starts in his house. And you see, John the Baptist came preaching this repentance to, the, to God's people, preparing their hearts to meet, to receive the Messiah and the salvation through him. But there's also this promise It is so precious in these verses because it says that the person who comes in repentance to Christ, that the Lord will have compassion on him or her and abundantly pardon his or her sin. See, God never turns away. He never turns a repentant sinner away. He says, come. He says, seek. He says, return. But notice there is a window of opportunity that is only available for a person to respond to the gospel and be saved. I mean, we're warned to seek the Lord while he may be found and to call on him while he's near. And one day, it will be too late for you and for me to do that. One day. The Bible says... Now is the day of salvation. It says today is the day of salvation. And then Isaiah adds that wonderful parenthesis here. He says we should do this because God sees things more clearly than we do. He is wiser than we are. Verse 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Oh, what a concept. What, when you think about that, he sees things very clearly. And he's saying, come, seek me, return to me while you have time. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. And going even further, we're given an image here, a word picture of the effective power of God's word. Okay, this is God's word. I mean, verse 10 says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth 
and making it bear and sprout, furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so my word will be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without desiring, excuse me, without accomplishing what I desire and without it succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Folks, God's word, the words from his mouth, his word is like the rain and the snow that come down from heaven. His word comes down from heaven to us. And it nourishes us, it waters us, it causes us to grow. And just like a sudden rainstorm causes the grass to turn green and and, and the earth to revive, so the thoughts and the word of God bring refreshment, bring revival and life to our hearts. Just as God sends rain from above to water the earth, he sends his message from above to revive and transform our hearts. Come, seek the Lord, return to the Lord. And that leads us to our fourth key word, which is go. Verse 12 says, for you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. (laughs) I love that. You know, according to etymologists, word people, um, the word enthusiasm has its origin in, 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 in Christian history. In, 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 you know, they, they, when a, in the early church, when a, a new person, new Christian came in, they, they were so filled uh, with, uh, with joy, joy and zeal and, and power that they had never known before. And they, they didn't have a word to describe that. And so they, they came up with the word in, theos, in God, in Godism, okay? They have God within, so it's enthusiasm. And you think about that, and when I read these verse, verses, verse 12, for you will go out with joy, you will be led forth with peace, the winds and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. It sounds so much, I just sense enthusiasm. You see what I'm saying here? When you come to the Lord, when you seek Him in repentance and you return to the Lord, you will go out with enthusiasm. You will have joy. There will be power. There will be zeal. There will be a desire to do the Lord's work. But see... We don't have to have that because we buy things to fill that void in our life because if you don't have the power of the Lord, if you don't have the zeal of the Lord, if you're not filled with his Holy Spirit, then you're going to want to fill that void with something, something else. And what Isaiah is saying is that does not satisfy I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up here. You know, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, a lot of different sayings that kind of stuck in my mind, okay, over the years. And one of the things my dad used to say is he said, I remember him saying this, free is a very good price. Now, part of that's because he was probably cheap. But we also didn't have a lot of money. And whenever we came across something that free, that was a very good price. But I want to I want to submit to you today that free is the right price. Free is the right price. Going back full circle verse 1, it says without money and without cost. Without money and without cost. See the world The world makes you pay for everything that you get. Man-made religion makes you labor for every blessing you think you receive. Sin, our flesh, and the world will make you pay dearly for any promise of contentment they may offer you. 
But on the other hand, God places every offer he has on the table as a free gift. We receive gifts at Christmas time and the best gift we receive is the Lord Jesus. He places it on the table as a free gift. He offers salvation and contentment to all who will come free of charge. And since God's gifts are free, anyone can receive them. God doesn't require money. He doesn't require righteousness. He doesn't require good works or any other resource. The only currency God requires is the currency of faith. He will open the storehouse of his blessing to those who exercise simple faith in the offer to come to him. And folks, this is an offer that everyone, that anyone can afford. See, God has made the way of salvation open to us through Jesus Christ. And he has made everything ready for us to know God and to come to The table is set. Think about this. The table is set. The food is placed for eating. The drink has been poured before us. And the Lord is calling us to come to him and be saved. Realize that this Christmas, our debt has been paid. And our debt is ready to be received. See, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus this year, I plead with you, I plead with you to come to the waters, to seek the Lord while he may be found, to return to the Lord, but also to go out with joy and peace, allowing those mountains and the the hills to shout for joy and the trees of the field to clap their hands knowing that you belong to the one who owns it all. He owns everything that we can see and a lot of the stuff we can't see. He owns it all. Would you pray with me? Loving Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who loved us so much. He gave his life for us that we could be made right with you.